वेल्यूबल पैनलिस्ट श्री राजेंद्र सिंह जी श्री राजेंद्र सिंह जी इज मेंबर ऑफ एनडीएमए प्रोफेसर अनिल गुप्ता साहब इज प्रोफेसर एट नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया श्री सुभाष दत्ता साहब एस डी एम मोहनपुर श्री अनूप धर ही इज ऑल्सो आवर ब्रांड एम्बेस्टर इन मणिपुर फॉर स्कूल सेफ्टी इंजीनियर अवधेश कुमार वेरी यंग डिजास्टर मैनेजर डिजास्टर मैनेजर एडविन ओचागुबा सर्टिफाइड डिजास्टर मैनेजर फ्रॉम अबूजा नाइजीरिया डॉक्टर अरसद फरहान इंथुजियास्ट इन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट इंथुजियास्ट फ्रॉम हैदराबाद प्रोफेसर नामजी डेनियल फ्रॉम मिस्टर डेनियल फ्रॉम यूएसए एंड आवर मॉडरेटर श्री तंजू श्री वर्मा आई वॉन्ट टू वेलकम वन मोर टू मोर पीपल बाई बाई नेमिंग लाइक प्रोफेसर गिरीश जी फ्रॉम डीन फ्रॉम रायपुर रायपुर यूनिवर्सिटी छत्तीसगढ़ सर यू ऑल पीपल आर वेलकम टू एड द वैल्यू इन कॉम्युनिटी बेस्ड डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट डिस्कशन वी फाउंड दैट कॉम्युनिटी इज बेसिकली द इफ यू टॉक इन साइंस वी कैन से कॉम्युनिटी इज द एटम community is the atom in disaster management who suffered most in case of disaster but unfortunately uh, community uh, is not prepared uh, that's why uh, they suffered most uh, but it's my firm belief that this is challenge for uh, us in front of disaster managers including you all why our community is not prepared if we have a disaster management framework at national level at global level at a state level at district level then why our community is not prepared it means what we are doing till date is required to change it means what we are doing till date is required to change our methodology to train or prepare our community to face the disaster or you can say to fight the disaster or to minimize the effect of disaster what's happening in this day basically all social capitals are in community if you see on ground we all are in somewhere in community so all social capitals are in community and what we are doing how we are managing disaster management through government hands from government machinery so it means we are ignoring the biggest capital social capital of which is readily available in our hand we are focusing on train focusing on training few people right to making them disaster management expert but in large the community is being left behind so uh, uh, first uh, challenge is we are ignoring social capital second is second point from my side is in appropriate training method i feel who is suffering most they require training but it is found that mostly training centers are involved in train whom who already know something about the disaster management like in district we are training adm sdm dm <coughs> but who is who is sufferer sufferer is living in living in the last boundary of the district in villages so uh, another challenge is in appropriate training third challenge is in appropriate organization our community is not organized in such a way that we deliver the training to the community directly uh, like uh, 
till date we found that the school is the most organized community in disaster management where we focusing to work and until date we did disaster management plan of year about to 4000 school and uh, average if you uh, think um, uh, 500 uh, student uh, per school so you can understand the volume has been trained for the uh, disaster management in drr so uh, we have to identify uh, this community and train them so another point is uh, which uh, i want to raise that community never failed who failed failed managers managers did identify what is required and and what are the intervention to make a community to face or manage the disaster so uh, this is also challenge uh, we we feel community failed but community never failed from my point point is managers failed who didn't understand the need of the community and intervention for the community so these are the uh, few points which i uh, which uh, i uh, uh, thought to, to raise in this morning for the discussion the second part of webinar uh, title is planning and initiative so i just don't for solution be um, uh, going into the community even we did uh, village disaster management plan school disaster management plan uh, hospital disaster management plan Uh, where we were uh, we get to involve with the, our community uh, even uh, uh, we involved with the transporters so uh, i am training them for uh, in, in this day very common uh, fire this year mine battery fire so idea is we have to find different different community and let's i invite all please join hands with us and let's move toward the community and make them ready to face the disaster because number of disaster and intensity of disaster is going to incre increase day by day year by year so these are the points for talk uh, of the today uh, thank you everybody you all wel welcome uh, i am seeing on the screen ram krishna thakur ji from rachi uh, he was the cfo of jharkhand uh, you are also welcome thakur sir thank you thank you sir uh, so uh, uh, thank you tanushri uh, for uh, now and, uh, i am handing and, over the mic to we, you we, we yes, also, uh, nagul sir we also have gary dila pomerai sir so he is also connected here uh, welcome sir Very good. I, so i think you have you connected also, from the nepal okay so you are also welcome gary sir uh, 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 i i am welcoming you and uh, we will make the discussion very fruitful towards the community thank you everybody please tanushri let's uh, let's go ahead please thank you nakul ji for giving overview of the program and also welcoming all our eminent speakers and participant as we all are aware that uh, disaster management act 2005 empower communities to plan implement program mm -hmm. to respond to disaster effectively the key aspect of community is in involvement uh, and its sustainability so more we involve the community in disaster uh, reduction process more sustainable output we are going to get in terms of uh, building resilience of the community the most common element of community involvement are participation empowerment and making a, co a community owner uh, for their own uh, uh, act post uh, disaster or in the preparedness process so ownership by the local community is very important and as uh, nakul ji has defined that community is not only the rural villages or urban rwa so a community consider uh, is a uh, like uh, a school a hospital is also part of a community where mass number of people are moving in and out uh, um, uh, throughout the day like hospital or where school children are residing 6 7 hours so uh, like a school uh, so that is also a, a one community unit so uh, we have to prepare all our unit to respond effectively to disaster so unless the disaster management effort are not sustainable 
at individual and community level it is difficult to reduce the losses and the scale of the disaster so while people should own the challenges of any preparedness initiative it is necessary to take people involvement further into policy planning and strategy also so all those policies which are being developed by the government for uh, building resilience of the community uh, through uh, national disaster management plan national disaster management policy that should reach up to the community level so that they are also get acquainted with all the knowledge and skill building of preparedness and planning so with this i would uh, like to welcome sri subhas datta um, uh, sub divisional magistrate of mohanpura tripura to further enlighten us um, uh, with his thought on the topic today thank you thank you very much am i audible Yes, yes, very much. much. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you very much for. I am highly privileged that I am joining such a elite group today on the webinar. Actually, I was returning from a meeting. In between the in between that, uh, while I was returning to my office, I joined. Kunal Dhar from my state. He requested me for the program. So already about the program. I have seen the planning and the talk. Taken up for this for today. So I have worked for the last 15 years at the block level and in the district level at various positions as as block development officer, as deputy collector, and magistrate. And now I am working as sub divisional magistrate. So disaster was management was part of my whole career in the last 15 years. so we have trained a lot of volunteer we have given training to school school teachers students we have conducted mock drill we have given lot of leaflet containing information on disaster management leaflet booklets have supply were given to the student communities we have on mock drill at the gram panchayat level also but what i find that community till now we could not sensitize the community to respond during disaster when it happens and also we could not acquaint our people our community especially the vulnerable community on the risk factors so they are used to it on their traditional belief that nothing will happen there are a traditional belief also some places among some tribal communities will give some puja we worship nothing will happen so in a way whenever we do such risk analysis we say that these are your risk i can share you from my last posting i was sub divisional magistrate in jirania sub division there is a area flood prone area every year there is flood we have made a shelter house whenever the rain started we know that after 2 to 3 hours there the area will be submerged but as a subdivision magistrate and our administration could not could not appease the 30 families those who are in the vulnerable position during that flood prone area the you come out there is only 2 to 3 hours your house will be under water you cannot no 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 we will wait till the time we have given puja uh, we are calling a prayer doing prayer nothing will happen we had to fight with them take one or two families but could not bring all the families that night it was 10 night but these same people they have started when calling us on mobile shouting shouting in the that area because within the four hour the whole area got submerged and there is no chance for those 18 19 families to come back now we had to rush at 4:30 in the night with our disaster management team tsr to our state rifles with speed boats to rescue them so it took about 5 to 6 hours to rescue these families so this is an example like an example how the community is not well aware how we we have failed to make them understand the risks and how they should respond and how they should cooperate with the with our knowledge our information these are the thing so at the community level what i feel we have to we have to continuously find out the risk factors 
which is vulnerable to the community, vulnerable to the children, vulnerable to the livestock, vulnerable to the crops and other 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 infrastructures, other infrastructure, whatever is there, and we should continuously make a profile of those and sensitize continuously the and make volunteer group of volunteer find out some good person, good people who can understand, make a group, volunteer group, different types of group, so that they can respond, they can continually, continuously make them understand. We should go with the school children, continuously we should do these school safety programs, programs, so that our children become very much habituated to the disaster things, hazards things, risks things, so that they can make understand their own own communities in their own areas. So giving knowledge, continuously training, continuously talking to them, making planning with them, involving them in the community to respond during the disaster time is prime importance, should be our prime focus. Prime focus and continuously we should find out own, own method from the community. We can suggest the community. You tell us how we can save you. How, we, where, how can we manage this disaster? And along with our own inputs and our own system of disaster management, we can, we can make them educate, educate, educate. We can educate them and involve in our own administrative process. And we should continuously do the program. Not that once in a six months, seven months, we should say to the vulnerable area, people, communities, everything. And we should make profile. And we should supervise this same thing continuously. And we should have a mechanism to keep eyes on the same. Eyes on the same. I had managed uh, in the North Tibura district one control room. I have observed that the staff, officials, those who have, those we have put on duty, they are very much reluctant, not motivated at all. At all. So they, I have showcased 15 officials. Why you are not attending the your control room 24 by 7. So they came in a in a group, told me, sir, we are doing this duty. No phone call came for the last three years. Then I took a workshop for this. All the staff, 97 staff, those who are on duty for the whole month, every 24 by 7. In the workshop, we tried to make them understand make them understand everything. That I have only told them one thing. See, you are sitting in the control room, maybe for one year. Suppose you suddenly you got a message from some place, all people are sleeping at night too. You came to know from a source that there is a fire in, in the market. There is no people, but you could inform the nearest police station from here within 10 minutes. You could you could you can inform SGM, you can inform videos. Immediately, all everybody will rush, there will be less risk. Maybe your own shop will get. Save. So you have to wait till a disaster happens. That is our duty. We should keep eye on everything in the control room. We may not get a call in five years, but we may get a call after five years. At, at 2.30 in the night, the tsunami has happened in such and such place. The community should respond. We need this, this backup, this help we need. It can be disappeared within 30 minutes in the night. Otherwise, if there is no control room, you are not there, we will transfer the message so quickly to the DM, to the SDM, to the community of DM. So in this way, we can we should also motivate also. So planning, preparedness, motivation, involvement of the community, and work with them, taking them with us in the administrative setup is prime importance. I have seen in this way success can be achieved quickly or easily. Thank you very much. This is from my side. What I have uh, experienced in the last few years, I have shared with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, sharing your thoughts on community-based disaster uh, reduction. And uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, it is not just mobile uh, they should conduct at field level, which is very um, uh, easy to done in guidance of some outside uh, um, uh, response force, but it is important for community to identify their own risk and hazard which to which they are vulnerable and then prepare their capacity accordingly. 
because without planning if we are doing some mock drills and all at field level it is not the correct way to do it planning is an important part of uh, community based disaster risk management and um, community should own that plan that uh, so that the members of the community based uh, uh, disaster management plan teams should be the uh, representative from the community itself so it is very important that um, uh, community should get involved in each and every stage of uh, community level preparedness so that they can respond effectively after month of any disaster uh, and uh, they should also be aware of their own local hazard be it uh, anything like crop failure or uh, sudden uh, drought or uh, uh, prolonged uh, this thing rainfall so each community is vulnerable to some or other local hazard and community should um, make themselves aware of that their local hazard and the local indigenous knowledge and resources could also support community in the reduction process thank you sir for enlightening us uh, with your thought uh, i would now uh, like to welcome uh, uh, sri arup dhar community uh, disaster response volunteer atd rva to express his views on today's issues am i audible yes sir good morning uh, to all our esteemed participant uh, disaster manager par excellence director jhoon food solution uh, nakul tarun ji and uh, successfully previously we have organized uh, with our partner uh, partnership with jhoon food solution to international webinar the theme for uh, today webinar is the time tested one for all of us that is uh, the prime minister 10 point agenda on drr item number 8 and uh, this this webinar international webinar is being organized jointly with john for solution and all tripura disaster response volunteers association we have the dignitaries sri rajendra singh ji honorable member ndma government of india professor anil kumar gupta head ec drm division nidm government of india and uh, what the way uh, also our sdm honorable sdm mohanpur sri shubhas datta sir has uh, elaborately explained uh, his views how uh, we should uh, work for the community with the time demand says uh, something so as sir has pointed out that we need to focus and also to see how the activities are, d- are done in the community level with the local machineries as well as how can we can make capacity development in the community make their roles more effective instead we should help uh, ourselves instead of waiting for the government will come and help us administration will come and help us so i hope uh, this deliberation for today's program will take a long long way for all of us and we will be hearing our esteemed guests and also our participant and we will take forward a way how we can make more community resilience activity at our end as you know concerned with our state tripura north state we are most vulnerable to earthquake and we fall on the seismic zone of seismic zone 5 uh, we have very bad experience on the cyclone flood drought and also with thundering this issues lots of crops are being also damaged as uh, highlighted by our uh, sdm sir so overall uh, good activities are being conducted here at our end we also with our less uh, resources we also pull on but webinar makes us to understand how easily we can take up the things planning is uh, very much necessary because we want to develop a safety culture of all of us all around and disaster management is everyone business so charity begins at home once we make our family aware then we can go around and do a uh, community awareness sensitization program so with that uh, i thank each and every one and also to the director zone for solution uh, nakul tarun ji for uh, organizing such a wonderful conference and we'll be hearing uh, 
our esteemed participants and our guest i thank each and every one and uh, back to you tanushri ma'am thank you dhar sir we have rightly pointed out that culture of safety preparedness and sharing of knowledge would help us to enhance our um, uh, resilience and uh, basic uh, uh, skills for uh, risk reduction at community level as we uh, know that nature of disaster risk reduction activity may vary from uh, one disaster to other or from one period to other and one state to other you have rightly said that tripura is vulnerable to some peculiar hazard especially the earthquake is uh, uh, one of the most uh, um uh, uh, frequently happened hazard there and uh, it's uh, it, the tripura is vulnerable to uh, that uh, hazard uh, uh, to a very high level so preparedness of infrastructure is very important apart from the uh, community based uh, approach which we are trying to adapt at community level because they are the one who are the first responder and if they will not respond effectively after much of disaster in the golden hour um, the uh, losses could be very high in case of earthquake so thus it is essential that community uh, uh, should be able to respond effectively to uh, uh, the local hazard uh, uh, they are facing so with this um, i would now like to invite engineer abhesh kumar from uh, department of civil in engineering invertis university uh, to uh, give his views on today's topic thank you ma'am uh, again a very wonderful association of uh, zonfra solution and uh, all tripura and uh, the community from the tripura Uh, and uh, you know the we have uh, recently uh, go with um, uh, some web programs uh, based on various uh, problems of society and today we have taken another one and uh, i am not uh, going to say man, uh, much thing because already they have been covered by anukul sir and uh, uh, arup sir and uh, uh, sdm sir so uh, I, i have a separate talk so i will uh, uh present my views in my talk so uh, before that we have the uh, so it is better to invite uh, farhan saab so he is connected with us from hyderabad and uh, i got a uh, uh, i got a request from the uh, arup saab that one video is there so we have to play a video so i would like to uh, request uh, administrator to kindly provide me the uh, uh, right of sharing sharing rights so that i can play that video for for answer and uh, he the, uh, after that video sir will deliver his uh, thoughts uh, and share his opinion with us kindly provide me uh, rights on both ids i have connected with the two uh, ids see hope you already found sir i have connected with two ids please provide me rights on my both ids because i am not able to share okay dekhiye yeah. dharmveer ji ne kar diya hai right now i have so this is a video i am going to share with all of you just a second i am sharing it sound as well so that you can hear the sound along with the video going on air for this one needs to assemble a small kit containing various equipment such as radio frequency device small mouse code transmitter and wave meter to measure the frequency of the wave generated a crucial point is that the operator needs to ascertain that he or she sticks to the frequencies allotted by the government assembling a kit can be a tedious task for a novice especially while sticking to a limited budget offering solution to this challenge is hyderabad's hem ashar farhan ashar is an expert at making low cost radio devices while he started this venture to help the hams slowly this workshop has grown to be an ngo proving employment opportunities to women 
Devices made by Usher are popular both in national and international markets. So this is the BITX radio and it's a complete radio is on one board. So onto this you add a volume control, a mic, speaker, antenna, power supply and it becomes a full radio set. You can mount it in any box that you want. I have mounted this in a very nice box which a fellow ham has designed for us. So once the basic radio is going, then you can start modifying it little by little and trying to make it more personalized according to your own tastes and whims and fancies. So uh, this is very low cost. In fact, if you just bought the components and made it yourself, you could probably make this radio for about 500 rupees. Despite its applications in difficult situations, ham technology has not quite caught up with the public like the mobiles. So thank you and uh, I would like to uh, hand over, uh, over uh, Tanushi ma'am to please invite sir for his further uh, session. Thank you Abdezji. I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Ashad Farhan, amateur uh, um, enthusiast from Hyderabad to uh, give his views on today's uh, topic. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I must, uh, before I start, <coughs> express um, uh, my, uh, I would like to apologize because I was imagining that this was going to be a very technical session uh, with radio engineers, but it turns out that uh, it's more about uh, organizing and managing uh, disaster and you know there are a lot of disaster experts here so um, I'm a little unprepared but what I will do I will try doing what best I can to uh, you know dumb it down and you know not discuss too much of the technical aspects but the practical aspects of using ham radio for this you know in disaster and what can be uh, quickly done okay so um, I would like to, uh, you know, begin by just, uh, you know, uh, talking about where ham radio is situated uh, within, you know, the whole uh, entire uh, business of, uh, of, you know, uh, disaster response, I should say. So um, one thing which, you know, became very... Uh, famous, so to say, is that uh, when the tsunami struck the Andaman Nicobar Islands, it just happened that coincidentally, uh, a, a few radio hams were there. And the reason that they were there is very interesting because what usually radio hams do is they would like to go and operate from places where um, no other radio ham has operated before. And uh, that becomes very attractive for other hams to contact them because you know, just like you keep collecting stamps, you keep collecting contacts from various parts of the world. So Andaman, nobody operates on a regular basis. So these people had gone there to operate and that morning with, you know, they suddenly discovered that tsunami had happened. And then they became the only contact, uh, the only communication line between uh, mainland India and and even Nicobar Islands for almost three four days, and they were very critical in providing care at that point in time. So um, with that, uh, you know, small uh, sort of an introduction, I wanted to uh, you know talk about what ham radio is. So you know what ham radio is. Ham radio is essentially a hobby in which radio amateurs. Uh, typically want to contact each other. They are licensed by the government. They're given free spectrum, which is very unusual because you must have heard how much the 2G and the 3G spectrums cost. But for radio hams, uh, the spectrum is given for free. And because of that, what happens is that uh, they try operating with almost any kind of uh, uh, equipment that they can have. And a lot of people like me uh, specialize in actually making 
their own uh, radios. Uh, and that's actually very critical to emergency response as well. <clears throat> so how do they train and what are the benefits of doing this is something that you know I would like to just spend a few minutes talking about and then get to some specific kinds of radio videos to do this. So what happens is this, that uh, usually uh, radio uh, hams uh, train with something called as a field day. I will see if I can, uh, do I have permissions to present here? Uh, please provide permission to sir. I request administrator to please provide uh, permission, sharing permission to Farhan, sir. <clears throat> okay. Let's share. Yeah, I will hang on. So far, a little different than this. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the activities of ham radio is called a field day. Uh, where basically radio hams like this, that that's me on the right, on the left is Anil Akash and Aditya. Sorry? Hello? No, sir, please carry on. Please proceed. My okay. mic was open actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, in a field day, what happens is it's like a picnic. So they basically take their radios out in the field and operate from there for con continuously for 24 hours. Now, while it also provides radio hams to meet with each other and spend time with each other, it's like a picnic. But the serious aspect of it is that it allows them to practice uh, emergency communications because one of the key factors uh, of field day is that you cannot take regular power. You cannot depend on any antennas or any infrastructure at all. And this is actually the key part of ham radio that is ham radio allows you to and enables you the technology and the science and the laws of uh, spectrum allow you to establish communications without any infrastructure zero infrastructure right so the there may be no power there may be no internet there may be no telecom everything i mean usually for example with floods and there, there are a lot of floods in my state uh, earlier, it was a combined Andhra Pradesh. Now it is Telangana and Andhra. Uh, almost every year we have floods and we have cyclones. And the first thing that falls in a cyclone is the telecom tower because you know it has a lot of uh, wind resistance. The, the cross section is pretty high. So that's the first thing which topples over. Now we also have fiber optic and you know um, uh, other forms. But earlier we were dependent mostly on microwave links and that would you know, get knocked off the first. So um, the idea of ham radio is that we can provide communications by just walking into a completely barren place where there is nothing available from power onwards. Uh, so this was actually a field day that we did in the middle of lockdown. So what happened was that we were all sitting at home and we had nothing else to do. And uh, we had just taken our vaccines. So at that time, we decided to do field day because it's all outside. You can see that you know I'm still uh, uh, holding my mask. We had just taken out our masks to take this picture. So we put up a shamiana, etc. I mean, this was far more comfortable. But there are other, uh, you know, uh, there are other uh, field days which are not that comfortable. And I'll show you some of the. Yeah, so this actually is a, is a field day antenna. Now, as you can see that it's actually put on a small tripod 
and this tripod is actually used for uh, you know uh, putting these lights when you do videography so it's actually very lightweight it's lighter than even a camera tripod it's about you know one to one and a half kgs you can easily carry it and a typical station let me just see if i can see that uh, can usually be packed into a complete i'm just seeing if i can show you that so this uh, here is a complete ham radio station as you can see it's very small the entire station is hardly about one to one and a half kgs and uh, it does not even require any special antenna so uh, what you do is you basically fling a piece of wire of an exact length over a tree so here you can actually for example see somebody putting up an antenna and they are putting this up with a catapult so there is a thin a string tied to this catapult and with this thing uh, with the string you basically put it over the tree you pull it from the other side then you, you know the wire goes on etc etc so that's actually the key thing i don't know why this is some red line red lines are coming here i think that's because of some new feature here anyway so now the thing is that the this is typically what's used for emergency communications this kind of a set and this set is actually a homemade set and uh, it's cheap it's homemade but it's also very different from a commercial set and i will just come to what is the important thing here so if you see that this here is a communication set okay uh, this is very you know common uh, radio now it's called ic7300 and it costs about 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees to set up a station with this okay so um, uh, this is a japanese set and uh, you know it's it's almost practically impossible for all radio hams to be able to afford this set although abroad i mean all of them do uh, you know uh, they do own this but in india it's impossible to do that and given the fact that ham radios are private people who are training for emergency communications on their own uh it's not even feasible for the government to supply it to all radio hams right it's a very expensive piece of equipment so what you have to do is you have to actually build your equipment that's one reason to build the equipment the other reason also is this that an equipment like this consumes about 2 amperes of power at 13 volts which is approximately about 25 watts so 25 watts of power it consumes at all times even when it's not transmitting so if you typically have any kind of a battery that battery will run dry very soon uh, within hours at times or if it's a car battery probably it'll last a day but you know not beyond that and if you start transmitting it'll actually drain it out drain out even faster even much faster so Uh, and that's because these radios are not really meant for emergency communication so they are meant to provide operators with all sorts of facilities you know uh, all kinds of modes if you see that this is a completely digitally controlled radio you see so many switches etc etc it's also very complicated to use i mean i get confused using these really complicated radios so as opposed to this radio which costs 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees um, i would like to um show you what i have done um so uh, let me you know just turn this off and see if i can okay so um this here is a radio which i have built myself i have taken off the cover just to show you the insides now all these parts were are available in india and not only are they available in india i actually made them because during the first wave i was actually exposed to somebody who had covid and i had to isolate myself in this very room where i'm you know speaking from and all these components were found in my you know lab here in my home lab so i just built it out of that now the thing is that this particular radio uh, in fact i call it for log 40 because you know it was made during the lockdown and it works on 40 meters uh this is the radio and this here is 
the entire antenna system okay uh, so and this is the radio right uh, and that's it i can actually use my uh, phones to do this and this can be powered simply by you know a pack of regular if uh, you know uh, aa cells and this particular one i have been operating this set uh, over the last one year um, most of the times when you know for example we go out for drives we go out for a lot of hikes i just put this entire set of the antenna this and this power supply uh, which is just the battery all of this into a box and take it with me i can actually put it into a very small bag of this sort right and and take it with me now <clears throat> this is specially made for operating from any location uh, without requiring lot of support and that actually makes it very uh, different from what a regular modern radio is supposed to do so the first thing that you need from a radio like this is very low power consumption okay very low power consumption so as a result of that it cannot actually have a computer or a display etc etc that's why you see there's no display here of the frequency so the frequency actually is limited to a very short range uh, and you basically you know tune from one end to another so you're always within safe frequencies and uh, second thing is it doesn't even have a speaker so you always have to put a earphone on uh, to to communicate but the third thing is a very odd thing and you might find that you know this is such a such an old technology that it works only on morse code and people you know are often surprised that why would you like to use morse code and telegraph instead of voice and data communications in this entire age so the reason for that is this that the amount of power that you require to communicate from one end to another depends exactly on the bandwidth okay so typically voice requires about 2500 hertz that is 2500 uh, bandwidth of 2500 Uh, to communicate and to be intelligible for example a telephone lines have a frequency response of you know that much 0 to 2500 whereas morse code requires just 100 hertz of bandwidth which means that the morse code uh, if you have 25 watts or you know 25 watts of a transmitter for voice the same can be accomplished in 1 watt of a telegraph or a morse code transmitter the range will be exactly the same right now there are digital modes like ft8 etc which do give you similar ranges with digital modes but the the thing is the moment you put a computer into it the amount of power that it will require completely you know expands and the set itself becomes very expensive so this particular set does not even have an ic it uses only resistors capacitors transistors and it consumes about 50 milliwatts of power that's all just 50 milliwatts of power which means if i just keep this connected here and leave it it will actually run for about a month if not more so it has a huge amount of standby power which is very much required the second aspect of this system is this that most of the communication systems that you set up for radio hams Uh, are meant to go as long a distance as is possible from you know one part of the earth to another i mean for example for most of indian hams the ideal you know the their big um, goal in life is to be able to communicate with usa because that's exactly on the other side of the earth and it's a, the longest distance uh, so what they do is they you know put up an antenna for example if the antenna is like this right so antenna basically radiates from its sides so an antenna like this will radiate out over the sides and it will go to it will hit the sky you know at the uh, at the very horizon and there as you know that short waves are bounced back then it bounces back so as it goes from here hits the sky and bounces back there is a region you know in the immediate neighborhood in which the signal does not fall and that's called a skip because you know it's sort of jumping over it it's skipping over this and for emergency communications it is the exact opposite most of the times 
you want a signal to reliably communicate within about 300 or 400 kilometers away maximum. That's the range that you're talking about. So in that case, instead of the antenna being like this, the antenna should be like this so that this wave goes up, you know, and bounces off the sky and comes down immediately. Uh, that's called a near vertical, inc vertical incident sky wave. So basically what happens is if it's perfectly vertical, it will go and it will fall back on the same station. So it has to actually go at a slight angle. So it's near vertical. It's not fully vertical. It's near vertical incident sky wave. Now, <clears throat> it's surprisingly easy to set up that antenna. Essentially, what you have to do is that this wire, which you basically come get out of this thing, it's just a, you know, it's, it's just a long piece of wire here, right? I mean, there's nothing more to this antenna than just a wire, right? This wire. This wire has to be stretched horizontally. Okay, about five to six feet uh, above the ground. That's all it's, it requires. And this is this wire is about 66 feet long. So wherever you can get some horizontal space where you can space it out between two bamboos or you know between two trees, you just put it out so that the, the wave goes straight up. Even if it goes down, it bounces off the, off the ground and then it again goes up. So that's the thing. So that's the second part of the system that you know you will be able to establish very reliable communications although the communications are in morse code and for morse code you require you know a morse key etc but the good part about this is that a radio like this can be assembled for about 500 rupees that's the most amazing part and almost every town in India will have the parts which will go into this. And there are some parts which are a little critical. So what I'm doing now is that we are able to 3D print these parts instead of importing them. So if you, for example, see this, it's called a toroid and toroids are, no, are not manufactured in India. But what we are doing is we have actually 3D printed this toroid. And for tuning mechanism, as you can see here, uh, there's a variable capacitor used here. It's, you will see it move here now, right? So this is moving. Um, these are no longer manufactured. So in, in place of those, uh, because I had a part, I used it at that time, but I've 3D printed a new way to control frequencies uh, where basically there is an inductor which controls the frequency and there is a bolt here there is a bolt here actually, you can see that there's a bolt here which goes in and out and that actually changes the frequency of the inductor so that you can tune the radio. So um, the, the, the RF engineering which goes into a radio like this is actually very modern. Although we are still using you know, something which is about almost 200 years old uh, telegraph, Morse code, but there are several benefits to this. One is that whenever you receive Morse code, you always write it down, right? As you are getting the dots and dashes, you write them down. And it becomes very easy to handle traffic because most of the time, uh, you, it's not oral words that you have to pass. You know, I mean, there are disaster messages which have to go to the uh, district magistrate or, you know, uh, the disaster teams. You have to coordinate it with people, you know, in the control room, etc. So... I have worked the control rooms a couple of times and it was always that you had to take down the message from to and the operator has to sign on it, right? So they basically, you know, sign out on it, which is actually very easy to do with Morse code. And uh, it's actually very easy to train people also. People think that it's a very difficult uh, thing to uh, train yourself in, but about, you know, eight hours of training time is more than enough for you to have very, very capable and useful, um, you know, skills in this. No, 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 no. So uh, that's uh, basically, you know, what it was. I, 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 I had prepared to show the entire circuit diagram, etc. But I don't think that, you know, that's appropriate here. And uh, with this, I will, uh, you know, uh, say thanks for allowing me to present this here today. And if there are any questions, I can take. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farhan. Thank you, ma'am. Hmm.
Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farhan. Um, now, uh, I think APG, if uh, Mr. Edwin has joined, or uh, you would like to go ahead with your talk? Uh, let me check if he's there. Uh, first thing uh, I would like to uh, <clears throat> say to uh, Farhan sir is, I would like to recall a famous quote of a uh, great innovator, electrical engineer, he was Nikola Tesla and other than us. And he said once that when the wireless is perfectly applied the whole earth, then whole earth will be converted into the huge brain which is, in fact, uh, it is all things being particle of a real and rhythmic world and whole. We shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of the distances uh, by your presentation and whatever you tell us about uh, uh, your valuable experience. And uh, as an engineer, I like your presentation very much because uh, lots of innovation you have did by yourself and it is it is great, sir. And thank you for sharing, uh, sharing this uh, important information with us. I hope everyone is going to get benefit of uh, from this. And meanwhile, I would like to uh, uh, request if let me check. Arup, Arup, sir, Professor Daniel has joined or not? We No, no, not yet. He's uh, having network challenge. He'll be joining. Uh, uh, DM uh, Ochago, sir, has already been connected, so we can pull him. Okay. So, uh, uh, could you please okay, allow me? Otherwise, uh, I will proceed with the session. Uh, could you please allow me for a few seconds? Uh, uh, anybody please. wants to? Yeah. Anybody who would like to interest in ham radio uh, to be a ham radio uh, operator, contact Tarup sir. Uh, contact Tarup. Uh, he is a ham radio operator, so he'll help out uh, to come into a ham community, ham activity. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Avdeji, I think uh, DM Edwin Ochago has already joined. So, uh, uh, we should first listen to him. Avdeji has, right, right, uh, right. has also yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will because we are the we, actually we. Actually, we are the host country, so it is better to our guest speaker from other countries get uh, more and mm -hmm. more time, mm -hmm. so that we are able to uh, get benefited from his uh, their experience, valuable experience. Uh, yes, yes. Please, ma'am. So, I welcome you, Mr. Uh, Edwin, and uh, Mr. Edwin is PhD certified certified diaspora professional from Abuja, Nigeria. So, I request you to kindly unmute yourself and go ahead with your. Uh, thoughts on the uh, issue of community-based disaster risk reduction. Mr. Edwin Ochago. Mr. Edwin, can you hear us? He's showing his hand. It's, yes. Okay. So if you can, if, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself. I can see your mic is muted right now. In mute position, please unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Your mic is unmuted. No, sir, it is on. Uh, uh, still in mute position. Edwin, sir, please. Uh, yes, yes, now it is yes, unmuted. Sorry. Please go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, it's a privilege to be in your midst. Uh, let me start by thanking Mr. Arubda and other top uh, executives in India for this privilege to be in your midst today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you sound and clear, please, sir. You can share the PPT of Mr. Edwin. Just one second.
Okay. Uh, do I have the floor now, Mr. Aruda? Yes, sir. Uh, your PowerPoint presentation is being shared from our end. So be patient. Uh, it is being shared from our end. So accordingly, you can go ahead with your uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name remains Edwin Ochagoba from Nigeria. Uh, like I've earlier mentioned, uh, permit me to stand on the chief host, permit me to stand on established protocol. I want to believe I am loud and clear. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We can hear you loud and clear. Just a second. Okay. I'm sharing your PPT. Okay. I, I, okay. I have been given the topic, uh, the role of NGOs in disaster management. Right, and right. I want to begin by appreciating the team for putting up this educative topic, which today in the world of disaster management, we all know the non-governmental organizations and the I request administrator to please provide me the sharing right. Please provide me the sharing right of my both IDs. Thank you. Okay. Our key stakeholders are in the management of disasters. And I'll be very brief. Like we all know, disasters are complex events with multifaceted causes. And hence, disaster management needs comprehensive and multidisciplinary training to deal with both complexity and change. Major shifts have occurred in the way in which disasters are considered, resulting from an increasing awareness of problems internationally, along with an identified need for solutions. In the wake of this, this brings to mind that a disaster is therefore consigned as a severe disruption to the survival and livelihood system of a society or community, resulting from their vulnerability to the impact of an or a combination of hazards involving loss of lives and property on a scale which overwhelms the capacity of those affected to cope unaided. And without being told, uh, we can all understand that when a disaster strikes, the community suffers the more, whether in terms of loss of lives and disruption to properties. And this brings to mind why this paper will be looking at. The, the, the aim of the paper is to examine the role of NGOs in disaster management. While the objectives are to determine the role of NGOs and its function, assess the current role of NGOs in disaster management. And it also look at uh, a brief concept and definition of NGOs, community, disaster management, and also the key stakeholders. And I begin with the NGOs, which is the centerpiece of the trust of the paper. The idea of NGOs has a range of contemporary meanings. It is a distinct category of civil society and a distinct group that is non-governmental in nature and funded with a not-for-profit oriented objectives. Other civil society groups include actors from grassroots communities, religious institutions, think tanks, and broader civil society organizations, such as university-based experts or academics and non-governmental individuals. Also, 
Non-governmental organizations, co commonly referred to as NGOs, are usually non-for-profit and sometimes international organizations independent of government and international governmental organizations that are active in humanitarian, educational, healthcare, public policy, social, human rights, environmental, and other areas to effect changes according to their objectives. They are thus a subgroup of all organizations funded by citizens, which include clubs and other associations that provide services, benefits, and premises only to members of the said group. And this is why the NGOs are commonly found in the space of the humanitarian activities. Let's also look at the community because most of these NGOs operate in various community. And it will be very important to also have a grasp of what community is all about. Community can be described as a group of people that recognizes itself or is recognized by outsiders as sharing common cultural, religious, or other social features, backgrounds, and interests. And that forms uh, a collective identity with shared goals. H however, what is externally perceived as a community might in fact be an entity with many subgroups or communities. It might be divided into clans or caste or by social class, language, or religion. A community might be inclusive and protective of its members, but it might also be socially controlling, making it difficult for subgroups particularly minorities and allied groups to express their opinions and claim their rights. It's also important we'll look at uh, briefly what is disaster management. Hence, the paper is looking at the role of NGOs in disaster management. And briefly, I will say disaster management can be simply put as the management of disaster as the act of carrying out activities to mitigate, ameliorate, rehabilitate, recover, prevent, prepare in the event of the occurrence of any form of disaster. Disaster management aims to reduce or avoid the potential losses from hazards, assure prompt and appropriate assistance to victims of disaster and achieve rapid and effective recovery. And this is uh, majorly what most of the NGOs involved in disaster management and humanitarian activities have been doing uh, in the provision of relief material, responding to issues that need to bring succor to victims of disaster, and also setting up temporary health camps we are that is need to provide uh, health attention to victims of disasters. And this brings to mind uh, the key players in disaster management. And the key stakeholders in disaster management without, uh, let's say, includes government and its parastatas, NGOs, donors, the private sector, the media, the academia, regional cooperation, community citizens, and the immediate environment. Just like what uh, this important gathering has brought to bear, because it is my humble belief that persons from different facets of the society have been brought together to look at, uh, to anchor this program in order to also improve on the ways our NGOs are involved in disaster management across the globe. And, and this is why the community, the government at all levels, 
both central, state, and the local level is involved. The NGOs, the CBOs, donors, civil society, academicians, corporate sector, the financial institutions are all involved in the process. And it is the duty of the NGO to ensure that they take a lead in various communities to collaborate and liaise with these various key stakeholders in the management of disasters at all levels. Let's also look at, so also some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, principles of the NGO management approach, because NGO need to devise mechanisms to enable them to be actively involved in the day-to-day -day activities of disaster management, as disaster management is everyone's business. Disaster management is everyone's concern. So the management of disaster cannot be left in the hands of only the government. The NGOs and other critical stakeholders needs to come in place to support the government in order to have an effective and efficient management of disasters. Just like what the academia does today in trying to bridge the gap uh, in terms of knowledge and capacity building. So the NGO also ha have a lot of approaches they need to deploy in order to carry uh, all other experts uh, along. And one of the approaches for the NGO is the participatory approach. The participatory approach uh, has to do with when the NGO and volunteer organizations ideally involve, they involve the beneficiary and stakeholders at every stage of the planning, delivery, and the measurement and process. These participatory approaches allow for an ongoing dialogue throughout the project, and it involves stakeholders and beneficiaries in the collection and analysis of findings. It's also gainsaying to say that uh, participation also refers to the full and equal involvement of all members of the community in decision-making processes and activities that affect their lives in both public and private sphere. The level of participation will depend upon how rewarding people find the experiences and whether they gain something from the process. There are a lot of instances whereby if the members of the community are allowed to participate fully in developmental projects, they seek to take ownership of this project and it gives the uh, community more lasting uh, gain, whereby they try as much as they can to protect these projects. They do everything possible to make sure this project live above time and do not fall short of mismanagement. But in a case whereby the participatory approach is not taken into consideration and developmental projects are put in place in communities, the chances of the community looking at it as one of those projects that have come to bring disadvantage to them is very high. But when you involve the community, they take ownership of this project. And this is why the participatory approach amidst all approaches is one key approach that needs to be embraced. Also, uh, let me also, also have the need base, also have the flexibility to give room for all possible means to be involved in the process. And also we have the transparency and accountability. And the transparency and accountability refers to that provision of accessible and timely information to stakeholders and the opening of organizations now procedures, structures, and processes to their assessment. It requires informing people of concern and duty bearers about NGOs protection mandate, policies and capacities 
I'm being open about what the organization is able to provide and its limitation in human and material resources. Persons of concern can take, can then make informed decisions about what they would like to prioritize and what results they can reasonably expect in many countries. There is no clear regulation of NGOs and their accountability. Therefore, in many cases, NGOs are accountable only to their donors and beneficiaries. However, since NGOs can have access to taxpayer money in some countries like Australia, this is to say NGOs must be accredited to be able to access government money. And in this case, it is advisable that almost all uh, uh, nations should try as much as they can to accredit all NGOs. Like in my country, uh, all, every ministry's parastatus MDAs have a DEX whereby NGOs are to register with them. And if you want to be involved in programs that has to do with the ministry, the department or parastata, and also assess certain level of funding, your details are with them. You would have registered the, your roles and responsibility or functions, your statutory capability is already known to the government. And as such, gives a fair uh, playing ground so that some NGOs will not operate to the detriment of members of the community. And this is why uh, accrediting NGOs is very, very important because some of the NGOs will uh, have a negative impact on the community if they're not properly accredited to do the right thing. Also, let's also look at the sharing approach. This may include sharing successful experience and information so that others may replicate them or appealing to external parties. It may even include skills to negotiate better terms with other stakeholders. Often, such skills are transferred through alternative techniques, such as theater groups, audiovisual materials, and other entertainments that local people can easily understand. And this is why it is highly recommended that NGOs should be involved in capacity building programs, they should be involved in information sharing activities with the government, with the community, so that the process of managing disaster will be very holistic. And also the sustainability approach is the possibility of maintaining the achievement of any support provided to community to ensure effective protection and solutions. And this brings me to the role of the NGO proper in disaster management. And I will start by looking at one of the first rulers, NGOs as the first responders. Thousands of NGOs quickly respond to disasters. Disaster focus NGOs often provide an assessment report, a situation report that explains what is ongoing on how many people are affected, what food and non-food items are needed by the survivors, and what actions need to be taken by whom and where such activities are often crucial. And this is why NGOs as first responders have a very serious role to play in every community. However, being on the ground, because the NGOs are always on the ground, uh, rapidly affect uh, uh, the activities of disaster, especially when a disaster strikes. The NGO are best at for a very long time in the management of this disaster because they are always on ground and an NGO with capacity and capability will be able to respond immediately before other lead agencies involved in the management of such disaster will take a lead and support the activities of the NGO, if not possibly taking over the NGO. And this is why the recent push for international NGOs to focus the, capa the capacity building of the 
the capacity building of local NGOs and grassroots communities is fundamentally uh, necessary. And also, uh, training first responders and local grassroots organizations for local disaster preparedness should be a long-term focus of all NGOs across the globe because these first responders are very vital in our various communities in the event of any disaster. Also, let's look at uh, NGOs as disaster risk reduction policy drafters and parliamentarians. Uh, like we all know, we have uh, some frameworks that have been in existence in the management of disaster, like the Yogo Framework for Action and the Sender Framework for Action. Uh, these two frameworks consider countries and their local disaster legislation as a foundation that provides a strong basis for disaster planning and directing of the whole spectrum of disaster risk reduction at different levels. Politicians should play roles not only for disaster risk reduction policy drafting and budgeting, but also for monitoring the implementation of disaster risk reduction. In the developing world, the capacity of local politicians is often limited. And this is why the NGOs has a key role to play, especially in terms of pushing for some of this policy drafting, implementation, and execution. Therefore, NGOs clearly have a vested interest in ensuring more inclusive policy documents. When NGOs go to sleep, and we have uh, no much of activities in terms of uh, pushing the government to be able to look into some key areas, then uh, we'll be having some little, little challenges. And this is why the NGOs have important role to play in the management of disasters, especially when it comes to uh, making of policies, drafting of laws in line with international best practice. They can make a serious contribution and impact to some of these documents. Let's also look at the promotion of community-based disaster risk reduction. Communities are often excluded from decision-making. For instance, uh, they're also excluded from decision-making for disaster risk reduction. As a result, their views, needs are often excluded in top-down disaster management settings. Community-based disaster risk reduction is seen as the best solution whereby communities can have their voices heard and their needs recognized. So it has become a common approach to build resilience communities via participatory disaster risk reduction. Let's also look at the promotion of participation by children. We said disaster management is a multifaceted discipline. And as such, the NGO have an important role to play in promotion of community participation by putting the most vulnerable groups first in building community resilience has been the key strength of NGOs over the last decades. NGOs such as uh, Plan International, Save the Children, World Vision, and child funds, among others, have been promoting the need to include children and youth in disaster risk assessment and disaster management planning. In my country, Nigeria today, we have been able to uh, uh, come up with an elaborate uh, program for students in our primary and secondary school, where they can be involved in disaster and safety management club. And this is primarily being driven by NGOs and as such, because uh, sometimes for the government to come down to the rural level, 
and drive some of these programs may not be as smooth as we think. But with the presence of NGOs in every community, the NGOs can ensure adequate promotion and participation of these children in, so, in some of these programs. And this is why it's a key factor for NGOs to see themselves very, very important in pushing for disaster management activities. Also, let's look at linking modern knowledge with indigenous knowledge. Not all the knowledge required to execute local disaster risk reduction intervention is available or accessible to local actors on the ground. Therefore, NGOs often generate necessary knowledge by translating expert knowledge from different languages and transferring it to local communities. However, traditional indigenous has the potential for disaster risk reduction. And this is why the use of indigenous knowledge is key. So, uh, I haven't considered the role of NGOs in disaster management. I also deem it necessary without uh, spending much of our time here. Let's look at uh, briefly the role of disaster management professionals. Because the disaster management professionals who have a staggering role in, pro, in supporting NGOs at all levels. And this is why I also decided to look at some of the rules. And one, to prevent disaster of any form from happening, because prevention is not only cheaper, but safer and easily handled than cure. Two, if disaster happens, adequate and timely response must be embarked upon to the site of such disasters. Also, to rescue victims of disaster. Four, to ascertain areas that are prone to disasters, either natural or man-made. Also, to monitor changing patterns in disaster. And they also have the role of monitoring frequencies of this disaster. That's also to look at uh, the aspect of establishing early warning systems to avert the impending disasters. Then importantly, to raise public awareness on natural and human-induced disaster, while provision of essential public health and safety services cannot be compromised amidst training and retraining of staffs, which is very key and vital to the management of this disaster. Uh, on this note, I will be drawing a cutting by looking at uh, the brief uh, of NGOs in across the globe. And this is why NGOs and the Center Framework Implementation Government faces mounting tax to achieve some of these global targets, especially like the Sendai framework of action. Uh, the first two targets are substantially to reduce global disaster mortality by 2030, aiming to lower the average per 100,000 globally. This brings to mind that apart from the fact that government remains status quo in their top-down approaches, and inflexible in their business model. Changes in government often take more time than this target. Therefore, there are many roles for NGOs to play. Some NGOs have been reluctant to promote private sector investment, especially disaster insurance and other financial means to achieve resilience. However, some have been trying to innovate in the disaster risk reduction sector by directly creating community awareness about the potentials of insurance in disaster reduction. And this brings me to the end of the lecture. Thank you for your rapt attention.
thank you mr edwin uh, for uh, uh, highlighting the role of ngo and uh, in disaster risk reduction and how ngo can play important role in various phases of disaster risk reduction if uh, we have mr daniel uh, uh, abdul ji so we can uh, invite him mm, let me check once aruf sir professor daniel hello yes is yes. professor daniel is connected with us he is having network challenge at his end uh, so he forwarded his uh, powerpoint presentation uh, so i am forwarding back to you or uh, if the floor permit me uh, i have uh, my presentation oh so you wish to present uh, because sir is not available right yeah yeah i will be going on with my own presentation what i have okay 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 i show you can go ahead because sir is not at different zero four now yeah so just so, uh, you can just uh, share me are you able to share your presentation or i have to no let me see meeting can only share no you have to share me the link host link you give me the presenter right okay uh, kindly provide presenter rights to arup ji please have you got the right arup ji okay let me no not yet host can share this meeting please wait a while you will get the rights soon yeah 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 i got it arup hope you got the right right Arup ji, have yeah, you got, got the it. right? Okay. Yes, I got okay. it. Okay. Okay. Just along. Okay. Meanwhile, sir, sir is presenting. Arup ji is presenting his presentation. I would like to thanks everyone who is very active in the chat box. I can see Vasudevan sir's message about excellent presentation, and I would like to convey this to Edwin sir. thank you is my powerpoint visible pal sola nahi aaga baat ho gayi meri is it visible yeah it is visible we can see the presentation please Thank proceed you. sir so i will try me apni maa ka koi kare apni ke liye bhi sarmindo ho kyun hai sir main to saab ko aap bhi utno kahe ke jo मोबाइल मोड Yeah, yeah. Now it is good. Now it is good to go. Okay. I am uh, going to present uh, mapping in disaster management. That is one of the basic component in community-based disaster management uh, preparedness. Whatever we do, the thing how we can actively make ourselves sensitized and also 
to keep ourselves update uh, ourselves in the community so i'll be pulling through this uh, presentation what i have gathered uh, throughout my walk uh, here at my end okay so we'll be talking on the uh, talking on the uh, social map how we prepare a social map with the exercise involvement of the community uh, people along with the local uh, urban bodies elected representative along with the conventional maps and also with the help of uh, using it space technology and other technology that are being effectively used for disaster uh, management work planning coordination so now we'll be uh, discussing about the social map conventional map and digital map so in dm map sorry in uh, need of uh, mapping in dm map to acknowledge the geographical location and uh, resources and other physical uh, feature as uh, our elaborately our honorable sdm sir has uh, highlighted uh, his experience for last 15 years how uh, um, he was carrying out his activities and easy to understand we need while we prepare the plan for the use of the community we need to understand Uh, how easy it is also for the community participation how they can effectively respond and even if a official also join us uh, uh, in a place so it should also be convenient at his end so that it help them in making the decision process and also with the research analysis and further planning presentation and we also need uh, for the documentation of the uh, um, a map in disaster management planning so in in community uh, level mapping uh, in disaster management what are the resources we uh, require in dm mapping we require social map we have resource map we have vulnerability map and also we have safe maps so these are the major component on uh, community level uh, mapping in disaster management so what are the major component that is to be uh, given uh, shape in the uh, social mapping what are the what are the context we require for the mapping that is total number of house that are available uh, in the habitation it may be mud wall it may be uh, pakka house tiled rcc house so we need to go on uh, making a field survey and after that we can uh, create a zone and on the zone wise we can just uh, put it together number of uh, building number of kacha houses pakka houses then we'll be talking about the roads and bridges which is permanent road temporary village road that are being connected with the highway then we need to also keep in mind with the water facilities number of ponds have uh, available in the habitation and location number of well and tube well also community infrastructure another uh, most important component we have uh, uh, temples we have club we have house cyclone center primary health center school post office etc et that are also to be brought forward in the social mapping component and the foremost is the river canal and environment uh, that is also required so how we can prepare a social map this is the major component what we require for the social map then for the resource maps what are the major component we require for the uh, resources map we require land and fields forest and trees boat truck buses trekker two wheeler 
pump set other implement that are being used in farming loom pottery wheels and artisan important telephone number power supply supply transformer dispensary and primary health center school post office and shape shelter house community center and temples here in the resource map we need to identify uh, in uh, our case we are here we are most vulnerable to earthquake very prone to earthquake so thank god most of our government establishments and schools colleges we have enough big uh, spaces where we can identify even in the resource map we also need to think we have our own you know domestic uh, pets cow and other things where we need to graze them where we'll give them their food so all this has to be uh, included in our resource map next is vulnerability and risk max uh, map sorry uh, we need to ask uh, two uh, simple questions the simple questions are uh, who are at risk definitely yes we the community are at risk what are the risks so this uh, risks has to be identified we have elder and disabled uh, in every household we have children below 5 years in every houses we have sick and ailing uh, patients we have family living in uh, trash houses we have fishermen and pregnant women so in that case while we need to collect the data first we have uh, the anganwadi kendras where we can go and sit together with the teacher in charge and we can get the count number of uh, 0 to 5 years of children how many are there we can just uh, put it in a figure then we have the families those who live in stress house that data is already available with the rural development if we visit the gram panchayat as well as other urban bodies the number of fishermen we can collect from the local uh, panchayat because every time there are been assistance given through the panchayat as well as from the subdivision level and the pregnant uh, mothers also we can get the data from the anganwadi kendras so these are uh, the the things that we need to keep in mind then we'll be talking about the safe and opportunity maps in safe and opportunity maps uh, we have the following component that has to be lined up according to the requirement of the community when you make a map you have to think what are the local demands and what people want such as a shape shelter house this government has declared a series of school as the safe shelter house and who is the uh, in charge of the shelter house and uh, along with their telephone number that are that is also being displayed in the school by the local administration authorities we have schools educational institution we have uh, high rise and also protected tube wells pond safe river and embankment moles for livestock equipment and human skill so what are the skill we have even uh, for the skill concerned a man working uh, in a government office in a fire department after few time he retired he is also a skill and asset of the community we can take their help so in this way safe and opportunity map has to be routed and it has to be done by the community itself and this has to be discussed with the community in presence of the uh, local authorities and this can be further incorporated and regular programs has to be initiated from the community level inviting the local authorities an alternate uh, route also has to be identified road and waterways subject to the geographical conditions then uh, who will carry out the map work this is the most important component in the mapping segment definitely the community or the habitation of the villages they will be carrying out and how they will be carrying out through the panchayat training institution or the panchayat elected member urban body member in presence of them this uh, map work will be initiated then uh, definition 
set of tool for gathering information has to be there and it has to be implemented and also monitored as our honorable sdm sir has already highlighted and uh, we can define pri and approach for learning about the rural life condition for uh, with them how we can make their life how we can also give uh, them going this uh, is a glimpse of a social map how the social map is being created by the community people this is one glimpse of the social map how it looks like this is uh, another map of hazard and vulnerability map how this also is being carried out uh, by the community people this is the resource map so in the resource map what is the distance from the uh, village to the hospital and what is what are the alternative routes so in that way uh, there will also be a index uh, with all the detail that has to be elaborately explained and it has to be displayed in a village where people regularly gather and in the panchayat and other office and the copy of the same also has to be uh, kept and has to help has to be forwarded with the uh, government local authorities this is the safe and opportunity map this has been done by the community uh, people itself this is the practical example at my place where i am it is almost a low line area in our subdivision every time it is a flood from every year we receive since it is the low line area the sewage gate is being dumped with all the garbage and water level rise up here it is uh, the picture which took by me in 2017 where Uh, subdivisional administrative authority has taken a very serious note of it and accordingly uh, this was uh, restored within next 24 hours this is uh, due to the uh, swiss gate issue where all the garbage was being dumped which uh, uh, property has been damaged you can see the roads condition how uh, it was been damaged very badly due to the water that has risen up at uh, my area and this is uh, the uh, river where uh, i have shown in my previous presentation about uh, the uh, ep center of that river from where it uh, uh, start it is a you can see clearly in the map uh, with a blue dot that is patni the name of the place half of the area falls within our mukut subdivision and half of the area fall within the uh, jirania subdivision that is under west tripura district and if you go down you may find with a green dot where uh, the place uh, is indicated uh, as high because it is the uh, low line area every time we get because we are on the lower stream we are very badly affected due to this uh, inundation of water and blockage in the drainage system this is the map of the administration uh, administrative division of uh, the lohornala basin and uh, you can see the location uh, in india in tripura as well as in the west tripura district about its uh, details that has been displayed here this uh, is the uh identification of low line and flood affected area uh in our subdivision and uh, accordingly uh, as of now uh, 12 places in our subdivision is uh, affected with various gram panchayat uh, that has been identified uh, as the low line area this is uh, hazard and vulnerability profile of our subdivision uh Uh, we get test of all uh, disaster thing happen here in our subdivision we have cyclone uh, march to may uh, in specific in two of the gram panchayat which is very high flood may to june in the, the respected area of the gram panchayat uh, it's very high drought october to november entire subdivision is low earthquake any time entire subdivision very high sun stroke march to may entire subdivision is high fire any time uh, in our subdivision entire subdivision is high these are few of our activities uh, despite how we 
go on uh, doing with our youth volunteer. This is the first wave of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID and second wave of COVID-19 uh, update. We went on uh, doing the sanitization uh, drive everywhere and having uh, sanitized as well as we distributed the mask and still we do day-to-day -day activities for the community. This is uh, how we mobilize the youth uh, to come. Uh, together we are in a team. This is the plantation drive that has been done uh, from our end because our main motto is to bring uh, disaster management more uh, effectively that people should, you young generation should take up the issue so that very effectively they can handle the disaster at their level, whatever capacity, whatever position they have. And they will be the best community first responder first before any response reaches uh, in this site. This is uh, the hospital at my area. This uh, was shut down uh, during the second wave of uh, second wave of the COVID, and we entire with our team uh, went and sanitized. And next day, the hospital was being opened, and the local service was uh, um, assumed uh, very shortly at our end. This is inside the hospital. How we have. Uh, go on uh, sanitizing. This is the local news that has covered our news clipping for our program. This is uh, one of the uh, police station where two of the officials was also been affected by the COVID. We went on uh, uh, sanitizing and after that, the uh, this uh, police station was again opened. This uh, were the initiative taken by us uh, we the help of the Central Reserve Police Force, where uh, we have surveyed and we have uh, requested them and accordingly dry ration was being allotted to them. This is uh, the Shachavarat Avijan, our commitment uh, to the youth and the society. We went with our uh, volunteers for uh, the hospital related uh, service. And this is some of the uh, effect, uh, cyclone effect picture, how badly that has been damaged in our subdivision that is in Mohanpur. So these are the few pictures that uh, were taken by me and we were there uh, in restoring with the other uh, uh, administrative authority. This is uh, the another uh, capacity building training that was uh, taken uh, by the IMD, we requested them. And accordingly, uh, we uh, joined in the training and after that we started uh, just whenever any warning or anything comes, uh, we go on awaring our local people and our PRI body. And accordingly, uh, we uh, still to date, uh, we take the precaution when uh, there's supposed to be a rain or something, we advise people not to go out and stay inside safely. This is uh, some of the incident that took place in our subdivision. Uh, you know, some accidents as well as road accidents. It is very prone also. Our subdivision is also very prone to uh, road uh, disaster. You can see even uh, these are been taken care very effectively by the local authorities here. And also the volunteers regularly go on helping. And this is a beautiful picture that has also been taken from my end. Uh, this is, you see how the violation take place. We also sometimes uh, help the authorities to inform, uh, enforcing authorities, uh, allow, requesting them to wear masks as well as uh, to wear the helmet and uh, maintain the uh, protocol. So finally, uh, thank you. Uh, this I had my presentation from my end. This uh, entire program is uh, is not possible alone for uh, me or all of you to do. We require to build a partnership. Without any partnership, no great work can be done. And once again, uh, thank you for sparing the time and listening me. Uh, microphone back to you, uh, Avadesh ji.
Thank you, Arup ji. And over to you, uh, Tanushree ma'am, please. Uh, Abdeh ji, Mr. Daniel has joined. Yeah, if he's uh, he's joined, so please invite him. Thank you, Arup uh, uh, sir, uh, for uh, describing uh, the various. Uh, uh risk assessment process at community level uh, how you are involving community at field level to develop all those various maps social map resource map and also um, the last picture which you have shown that uh, though we try to uh, uh, make community aware about all the uh, do's and don'ts of uh, disaster risk reduction even in the um, case of uh, current pandemic covid-19 we have seen that uh, uh there are many a times government has given a lot of guidelines to be uh, adapted by the community so that uh, we can mitigate the impact of uh, uh, changing variant but uh, sometimes community also are not able or not ready to uh, do those uh, behavioral attitudinal change so um uh, all those people who are attached to this platform i will request them that this behavioral and attitudinal vulnerability we have to reduce on our own so that um, uh, we can be able to build a resilient community um, uh, for the maps just i feel that uh, since we are also working at various places schools and hospitals i feel that this maps which has been developed in paper uh, th- uh, since uh, tripura is also flood affected state and flood is very recurring hazard in tripura so we can uh, 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 redevelop this mo- map in uh, some different format which we generally use in uh, like cell blow map uh, in case of fire this map would uh, help uh, easy evacuation and uh, uh, the life of this map is also very uh, i mean long uh, so uh my paper based map uh, generally get spoiled during flooding and all so you can think on this issue and um, we are there to support you uh, uh with our little expertise which we have developed since last 5 6 year of working directly at field level so now i would like to invite mr daniel uh, uh, to give his thought on the issue of community based disaster risk reduction abdeh ji he is here or uh, you may also like to proceed with your presentation then i think sir daniel sir Since it's already twelve thirty, so uh, in the meantime, you can initiate your uh, uh, presentation, uh, and we'll see if uh, Mr. Daniel could join. Then we can take him up later. Daniel, are you online? not yet nakul sir he joined twice because there is a network challenge from his end so i request uh, you to forward it to so let's move of this ji yes of this you are start the presentation abdeh ji are you online hello Yes, yes, sir. I am online, but uh, connectivity slightly drop at my end. That's why. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yeah, you are audible. Yeah, there is a connectivity issue from my end. So, if you want to talk, let's start. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> okay i would like to start my presentation that is about the community building and community uh, preparedness you know so we are talking about the community and community building exercises various exercises and various roles of uh, the ngos and technologies like ham already just presented on this platform 
so today because of certain technical issues i'm not going to present and share any presentation so just uh, i would like to uh, give a brief overview of the uh, capacity building exercises and uh, you know community capacity building and and then preparedness so <clears throat> i am turning my video off as well because हेलो हेलो यू आर ऑडिबल अभ्यास जी गो अहेड अब दिस सर क्लियर एंड लाउड ओके ओके आई एम चेंजिंग माय प्लेस आई एम चेंजिंग माय प्लेस फॉर अ बेटर सिग्नल बिकॉज़ द सिग्नल ड्रॉप डाउन टू टू स्टिल यू आर ऑडिबल प्लीज सर ओके 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 सॉरी फॉर द इनकन्वीनियंस so hello everyone and again thanks uh, zone for solution and uh, our friends from tripura for providing me the opportunity to share my views on community capacity building and preparedness and you are not able to see my uh, video because of the connectivity issues so let us discuss uh, certain concept regarding this exercise i would like to uh, recall not 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 big things but just uh, a simple example you know when we go into a, any gym and try to uh, oh, try to take a dumbbell of 2 kg so uh, in the initial level it is very difficult to pick it up and then we go for the 5 kg we go for the 10 kg people go for 15 then 20 so slowly the capacity of the body are rising in this way and why because if we try to uh, pick up a dumbbell of 20 kg at the initial level or you know higher one so it is not able our body is not uh, prepared for that so it is not possible suddenly to pick up that but slowly we can enhance this capacity so it is a simple example how capacities are built and how it can uh, bring the great results so what it's impossible at the initial level it is possible when we are prepared and our capacities are uh, on on a uh, capacity are built and moreover that we can say it can be said that uh, more people uh, will die not only because of the disaster we are talking about the disaster from uh, uh, 10:30 am as per indian time and disaster uh, but due to their uh, but they died due to their vulnerability and lack of planning to cope up with susceptibility of the calamity you know uh, that is why it is a single consensus all around the world that an effective response to an emergency is dependent on the ability of communities to determine the appropriate functional planning it is very important part of uh, any disaster management process uh, whether it is in india or uh, anywhere in the globe all the um, international framework where hugo sendai they are talk about that and then come, uh, when we discuss the uh, 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 national planning or uh, you know recommendation like prime minister 10 point agenda uh, uh, 10 point data they are also talk about the same so we are today pick uh, for example pick up the uh, point number 8 and the, we are talking about the capacity building so this is a integral part of disaster management process so uh, first portion is about the community capacity building and second phase is about the preparedness so first phase uh, let's discuss the community capacity building what it is and uh, how it is going to uh, be important or very significant in disaster management process so community is always the first respondent in any incidents whether any organization that is mean for the disaster management in any country it is going to come after the disasters after some time of the disaster but community is someone who is available right at the point of uh, of the incident so it is the first responder and community have been represent uh, responding to the disasters and have inherent capacity for response again uh, 
we can say here we can add on here that specialized capacity of communities have to be built upon for better and effective disaster management which is the need of the hour and for that different different steps have been taken at different course of time and uh, when we talk about the capacity as a general so the con combination of all the strengths all the attributes and resources available within a community society or organization that can be used to achieve agreed on the agreed goals hence we can say uh, if it is the capacity then capacity building can be uh, defined that capacity it is an ongoing process that equips officials stakeholders and the community to perform their functions in a better manner during a crisis or disaster you know we are talking about the it is not the uh, it is not uh, the government efforts are not alone if, uh, enough we all have the great understanding about that till now that uh, government is not only capable to manage all the uh, calamities all the disaster at its own level we have to engage all the stakeholders and especially the community so community uh, what is the uh, broad objective of the community building they meant that uh, with community we can ensure that disaster risk reduction it is a national and local priority first of all so uh, lots of gdp uh, lots of resources consume in managing disaster each year uh, we lost valuable life that cannot be returned and loss of property is another aspect so identify assess monitor disaster risk and enhance the early warning system is the need of the hour and by using the knowledge innovation education to build a culture of safety and resilience at all level it is the ultimate necessity but whenever these things are discussed so uh, these are underlying factors uh, we often talk about the main streaming activities into the development sector and program areas and often talk about the strength and disaster preparedness for effective response at all so how we can see this uh, various levels of community uh, we can strengthen the community at individual level uh, we can strengthen it on the organization level we can uh, enable an environment of that can promote this uh, capacity building exercises and when we talk about these three levels so obviously uh, the capacity building uh, have uh, has the different types uh, also have the different types like what type of community we wanted to build so technical capacity if we are going to build the technical capacity or whether we are what to uh, build the functional capacity we have to build it at the whole it can be holistic effort it cannot be uh, can build in uh, in the in, in uh, individually or in another in, in uh, when we come on this aspect of capacity building so let me very brief that education on disaster prevention and responses and training to the vulnerable communities collaboration with the relief agencies conducting the mock drills is important household preparation under understanding the warning de warning messages first aid preparedness these are the integral part of this so when uh, we see the capacity building process as a whole so we have to identify needs gaps and demand of any community and as per that plan and capacity building exercise should be introduced decision to invest it is important to uh, that uh, we have enough uh, uh, investment to uh, do all these things and uh, build cap and expand network capacity prompt awareness and drive utilization assess outcome and impact so these are the community and it's uh, uh, you know this entire process of capacity building and more important than every community have uh, some uh, section that can be said that that yeah, that can be designated as further vulnerable and this generate uh, this this arises a uh, uh, an issue of gender and uh, disaster risk reduction pact facts you know when it is often says that uh, uh, women and children are more vulnerable older elderly people are more vulnerable and obviously uh, a popular saying this when a woman uh, as a woman it is not it, it is not uh, allowed you know that don't collapse because the world around you collapses so it has to be keep going but uh, it is very uh, easy to say all these things but uh, whether it's practical practicable or not it has to be ensured by the people who are engaged in the camp uh, capacity building process in all around the world at uh, international national or local level 
so this uh, things is uh, this this aspect is very important and why this type of questions arises why this type of uh, uh, issues arises so researchers uh, has found that women are 14 times more likely to die in disasters because of various aspects for example in 1991 cyclone if we talk about uh, bangladesh uh, incident so 80 to 90% of deaths were Uh, from the women community and in the post emergence period women are more likely to lose access to the subsistence subsistence from lands farm lands uh, and that is why another dark aspect of uh, the disasters or disaster management that is uh, a practical aspect is that disaster increases the sexual assaults on women so of of 10 or 9 out of 10 women affected by the 2004 tsunami in india and 10 out of the six women in sri lanka suffered sexual assault within two years uh, at that time a study showed uh, 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 represented this data and uh, uh, by uh, viewing all these things so increase uh, it in all disasters uh, or seriously abrupt the social fabric of uh, the uh, social fabric when it outbreak uh, like we have seen uh, the afra afghanistan crisis and at Uh, 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 their uh, girls and uh, uh, girls uh, are very uh, vulnerable from all the all the external uh, disturbances so increase uh, increases the risk that girls and women they can be forced into the child marriage domestic work transactional work trans- and forced out of the education as coping and livelihood measures led to increases in the uh, trafficking of girls separated from parents and families you know a very uh, harsh incident from the afghanistan road report or news uh, come, uh, came from there that uh, people wanted to send their uh, uh, daughters uh, away from the afghanistan that's why they are marrying them at the early stages so as we are talking about the uh, vulnerability part of so so this increases their forced to childhood marriages there so uh, it is not a uh, incident that uh, held uh, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years back or some uh, you know uh, that uh, mid century mid century but it is the incidents of uh, uh, it is a current incident so uh, that is why uh, the capacity building is an important aspect and different type of vulnerabilities are associated with the gender discrimination like physical social economic and psychological vulnerability uh that is why this capacity building exercise become a prom- uh, uh, become a uh, topmost issue uh, because if we are talking and we are giving the responsibility to communities that you are going to respond first you are the re- we are using the quote again and again that community is the first responded so it is our duty that we have to see all this issue that we are expecting much but we are doing less so it is not uh, going to work so when we come on the second half after the capacity building aspect what is the capacity building how it is helpful for the society and especially the uh, gender based or you know the age based or various other uh, parameter based uh, capacity building exercise that discuss the preparedness uh, process at community or individual level as well so since uh, it is not a interactive one uh, you can you can only hear the audio so i can't uh, show you the pictures but uh, uh, let's uh, discuss very basic steps uh, that are responsible in the preparing uh, process so action steps actions uh, uh, when we uh, uh, read about the modern disaster management so there is a popular phrase you will uh, read anywhere in the on the internet or on any disaster magnitude that words into action so it become a common phrase that word become actions but it is really a highly uh, complex process that what we are saying so it is become it, it become uh, actually actionable so um, here uh, not going into the deeper details so uh, let's discuss some very basic uh, steps how a community can be prepared so first thing that is important is uh, that is important is uh it is uh, for warned is for armed it is a popular saying so one thing is the get informed and second thing is make a plan 
So as Nakul sir also stressed upon the planning process because uh, if you are exercising something, so it must be as per some plan. If you, you would not have any plan, if the society or community not have any plan and it is practicing something, so there are high chances that it may be entirely wrong process. So there should be a plan. Third is assemble a disaster and go kit. So what is the disaster and go kit? We will come to it. Uh, in letter pro, uh, letter part. So maintain the plans and kits. It is important and address, address the individual special needs. There can be the special needs on the society, uh, like uh, the elderly issues or disability issues, the vengeance issues. So it is uh, it should be taken into account while uh, while going for a preparedness process. So. Get informed. What is the meaning of the get informed? The first problem, the types of disaster in any area. The area from where the community is belonging from. So it should be properly aware, aware about the types of hazard or no, you can say disaster of that area. So is the area is flood prone? Is there are the high possibility of the material spill? Uh, is there any nuclear reactor is there? Uh, because we have witnessed the in some uh, some uh, uh, man-made uh, uh, disasters like uh, Fukushima Daiichi and uh, you know this type of nuclear nuclear uh, uh, disasters that uh, uh, that were uh, witnessed in the recent history witnessed by the recent history. So it should be also there. So uh, fires, old uh, fire contain both uh, for fires include both wildfire and household fires and winters, storms, disease outbreak, heat waves, tornadoes. So what are the possibilities that can hit a community? Or it, it is well aware by that, it, it should be well aware to that community. So get information is uh, a great thing uh, that, can be, uh, uh, that can be adopted while uh, going for a preparedness process of uh, the disaster management cycle. And then come, uh, then uh, we come on the planning process. Planning is extremely important because if it is not, uh, if something is not uh, effectively planned, so there are high chances that when it comes on the execution stage, entire process is going to fail or it it it, it is null and void. So uh, personal uh, uh, community should prepare uh, itself, or we should commit. We should, we should encourage so uh, to. Uh, uh, to prepare uh, to, to the community to prepare themselves for, at personal for home or workplace family level we also hear the family disaster management uh, management plan even we have uh, reached it at this level so family includes everyone in the household don't forget your pets as well because there is a, a, a uh, there is a uh, some uh, we can say pattern when people uh, uh, got stuck in a disaster, often they forget about their pets, and due to that negligence, uh, it uh, uh, it become fatal for them. Uh, like uh, not letting them free uh, from uh, from where they, uh, their shelter is, so it, uh, it it is highly fatal for them. And there are lots of uh, pets and lots of animals lost their life. Even uh, it is not the part of this uh, topic, but I would like to mention here that animal inclusive disaster risk reduction, that is AIDRR, it is also uh, it, it is also a uh, concept that exists in disaster management. There, where this type of things can be included. But here we are discussing uh, uh, a very slight part of that. And uh, next is the workplace educate the co-workers and disaster preparedness and communities. Usually, uh, in most of the workplaces, uh, people are entirely blank when any disaster outbreak. And it is my personal experience as well because I have seen uh, a, when when a, when, a, when an accident outbreak, when an accident happened on the roadside. So lots of people uh, uh, people uh, got blank at that time, and usually they well maybe they run away from the site, or if someone tries to help. So they may uh, uh, commit a lots of mistake that further enhances the injury. So uh, that is about the when we talk about the disaster pre preparedness plan. So we should also include also keep in mind that workplace uh, uh, work workplace uh, 
workplace education of the uh, workers uh, about the preparedness uh, and uh, regarding the community planning is, is uh, an essential part. And uh, uh, when, uh, uh, we should uh, uh, go for the plan to survive uh, at its own to at least 72 hours. Uh, community should prepare like this because it, the areas that are highly vulnerable like Uttarakhand, uh, uh, Uttarakhand is highly vulnerable to the seismic hazard and northeast as well. So, and uh, lots of uh, districts are highly prone to the flood uh, related disasters or some uh, similar type of, uh, you know, various hazard. So, they should uh, at least have to uh, actually plan to survive at least uh, 72 hours because this is the time when uh, the various government and specialized uh, you know, bodies uh, got activated and uh, uh, and start running their operation at the site, but it it is at least uh, it is at least requirement we can say. Uh, we should know our evacuation routes. Community should know what kind of routes is to, they have to adopt at the time of uh, the time when the, uh, the disaster outbreak, because taking the wrong wrong route may result into the uh, uh, large number of uh, uh, lo loss of the life and personal support network. Uh, we can uh, the community should adopt that uh, psychosocial support and uh, you know family contacts, copy important documents. Many times uh, during the flood situation, it is a, uh, as Tanushi ma'am was also saying that uh, when we uh, go for some map and it is made up of the paper. Usually, what happened? This entire uh, entirely wash out. And if you if you are depending on that map. 100% surety is that that map is not available to you at the time of disaster because you are waiting for what uh, for a situation uh, uh, when you are going to uh, use that map and what happened that map got banished or some key uh, uh, key uh, you know support system or critical facilities got collapsed at that time so it is not possible at the time of the when disaster outbreak so uh, uh, to cope up with that situation that's why we should go for this type of alternate method or the better, uh, 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 better uh, you know, technology that are available now, like the self blow map uh, that was discussed uh, uh, by the ma'am, by ma'am, and make a plan. Uh, don't forget to include. Community should uh, also include that learning the basic first act. You know, uh, right now there is a situation where the heart attack and different types of uh, diseases are very common now. So uh, if, you, if, if anyone knows about the first test and uh, life-saving skill like CPR, so they can save the, uh, at least save the life of uh, uh, life because they are available at that uh, uh, point of time when the person needed the most. Uh, so uh, anyone call the ambulance or something happened. So before that, if we got the medical attention at the right time in a right way, so there are high chances that the person survive or the, the, the member from the community survive. So, uh, and another thing, uh, learn how to shelter in place and where the two evacuation notices can come from. Um, sometimes a lots of rumors arises because uh, we have witnessed the COVID-19 and at COVID-19, you can imagine, uh, you, you, can, you, you, you and I both are witness, witness that lots of rumors were there. Even United Nations designate this uh, as the infodemic pandemic. It was, but uh, they are they were they also designated as infodemic because lots of uh, wrong information there. So uh, uh, it should be um, known to everyone that where from where the information is coming, right? So uh, whether it's coming from the local uh, law enforcement, enforcement, radio, television, is it is it authentic or not? Some type of rumors or not? Sometimes rumors did more damage than the actual disaster so uh, there should be uh, the proper uh, the proper uh, awareness uh, uh, from that and another thing uh, i was talking about the disaster kits and go kits it is for the community purpose uh, we are not discussing so 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 uh, what 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 is the difference in the disaster kits and go kits so it is a stationary versus the port portable uh, type of question so a disaster kit is something that uh, must be easily accessible in your home or office, uh, whatever the, uh, and uh, the water, uh, it, is, it should be for everyone in the, uh, for the community, uh, in the household for at least 72 hours, non-perishable food, 
games and books for the children, battery operated radios, flashlights, flame lights, candles, uh, and extra batteries. These are the part of, of the disaster kits. I'm not going to read because this is a set of, set of, of uh, things that can be included in the disaster kit. Uh, information is available. And go kit is that that must be portable to take to evacuation center or shelter. Water, it includes the water, non perishable snack item, games, uh, other things. So you, uh, uh, it also includes the bedding, sleeping bags, pillows, blanket, etc. And that is why uh, it, it, this uh, availability of these things uh, can save a lot of life, life of the community because the resources are always less. Resources are also always less. Okay, so uh, this is something uh, that should be the part of uh, our community uh, capacity building. So the conclusion conclusion is, uh, I would like to conclude here, the government alone cannot and will not be able to manage and handle all type of disaster with uh, its machinery without active participation by the people of any country. According to a common theory given by policy makers, experts and professionals, community participation is the most effective element to, to achieving the sustainability in dealing with natural and man-made disaster risks. So with this word, I would like to finish my uh, uh, presentation and uh, I would like to apologize that uh, uh, due to the poor connectivity, uh, the presentation uh, is uh, not so much interactive. You are already getting the audio. So next time we will take care of that. I will take care of that. So thank you so much for uh, patience, uh, patient listening. And I would like to uh, hand over the uh, mic to Tanushi, uh, ma'am. Please, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Abdeji. Uh, can we check with Mr. Daniel if he has joined? I don't think sir has joined. Uh, Arup, sir? He has it's not yet joined. There is network challenge at his end. Oh, He's can trying. we uh, quickly take up questions and answers? Yes, yes. Madam, please go, ahead. Questions. please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. So those who have any query uh, can raise their hand or uh, type in chat box. Tanusri, ma'am. Uh... We have uh, one of our disaster manager per excellence, Ambassador Dr. Shahad Umar Faru, who is also connected with us from Abuja, Nigeria. So we can request him if he have any contribution for our today's webinar with the permission from the house, uh, you can allow him. Yes, sir, certainly. Uh, Mr. Nabuja? questions and advice because it's uh, already one... Uh, uh, so uh, better take uh, questions and advice and conclude the webinar because everyone has lots of commitment. Please take questions, if any, or suggestions. Um, meanwhile, I, uh, one thing, that feedback form is available in the chat box shortly. So please uh, wait for a while. And uh, don't go without filling the feedback form because uh, it is important for the certificate purpose. Thank you. So uh, uh, no question or uh, no no advice uh, One second, sir, if you allow me. Yes, uh, Sridhar Garu, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. The advice is... Uh, the, um, the one the printer is unable to present the PDF, maybe PPT. The advice is before the uh, starting of the this session, uh, request uh, the send that PPT to someone. So share with this uh, two people who has a better connectivity, so that uh, the other can share. That is only advice. That's, thank you, sir. Bye. Already, uh, we'll take note of this already, uh, you know, uh, from our Delhi Zone 4 Solution Headquarters, the PPT is being shared uh, with them and also to our Avadesh sir also, since uh, Tanusri Madam is uh, the moderator for the program and the copy of the same is also being uh, forwarded to me also. 
So once you feed, send uh, all of your feedback link after the program, the PowerPoint presentation will be converted into PDF and it will be attached with your mail so that you can hook up with uh, what has been discussed. Uh, is it okay, Nakul, sir? It's okay. Our video is available on Zone 4 Solution channel, so you can go there and you, you can download. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, any so, other query? Uh, so, time is already one three. So, uh, because as Nakul sir has directed, because lunch time and everybody has one or other commitment. So, before uh, we wind up, we'll be waiting for some while for the feedback form that will be forwarded uh, here in the chat box. So, request each and everyone to kindly fill up the feedback form and. Uh, Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq, if you are uh, here with us, if you have any contribution, uh, please go ahead because we are running out of the time. We are waiting for your commitment, anything. Um, well, good morning from my end um, to all the organizers, Ambassador Arup. And I also want to commend the organizers for this successful uh, training section, because as we all know, disaster management is everyone's business. And I really, really commend the organizers, the presenters, and all the participants. All I need to add is we have to double our efforts, especially when we talk about uh, community resilience, community disaster risk reduction. That means for us, you know, it's not uh, all of us from the community have the opportunity to be with us on this Zoom. Because when, like in my own area, when you talk of some communities, they cannot even afford an Android phone, talk less of attending a Zoom meeting. So it is there is our responsibilities, those of us that have the opportunity to be here today, to go back to our various communities to ensure that we empower them, we uh, sensitize them, especially using our various languages or dialects. So with that, I think uh, it will go a very long way. Otherwise, thank you very, very much for all the excellent presentation. I am Ambassador Dr. Saad Umar Farouk, a disaster professional from Nigeria. Back to you, Nakul, sir. Nakul sir, I think um, uh, now it's time to conclude. Uh, if you want to give word of thanks, uh, we can conclude the session now. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining and uh, submitting your idea on the community based disaster management. Uh, we are very thankful for your participation, your contribution, your questions, and suggestions. Uh, what uh, comes out of this uh, program is we understand that planning, implementation, management is owned by community. So community must be aware and trained. Second, we uh, found uh, uh, in this um, uh, webinar that it's our responsibility to involve community as much as possible to focus on developing local coping capacity. Uh, thank you, everybody. I invite you all to join with us to reach out to the community, last mile connectivity, last person in the community, make them disaster resilience. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So from my side, I am uh, thankful for everyone, those who joined this webinar and added the value to this program. Thank you. Thank you, Tanushree. Thank you, Abdezi. Thank Hello. you. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Thank you, Nagalji. Thank you, sir. Hello. You. Hello. Yeah. Abdezi, go ahead. Uh, please, uh, this platform ko thode ke liye open rakhiye Please open this platform because feedback uh, form is still not available. So it will be.